Here at Bethel. Here at Bethel. Here at Bethel. Here at Bethel. We're pretty good at being Minnesota nice. Most of the time. But sometimes we have to say things we know people aren't going to like. Like during the election season coming up on November 5th. We could scream. We could be snarky and sarcastic. We could be rude and offensive. We could shut down and ignore people who disagree with us. But if we did that, we'd basically be like a lot of other people in America. But we are called to be different. 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 We are called to be Christ followers. Truth seekers. Reconcilers. And salt and light. We are becoming more of who God created us to be. That means that we have to speak and act differently. From now through November. And every day afterward. We have to act civilly. 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 Civility is more than just being polite. Or nice. But that's a good first step. Civility is the willingness to put others first. To promote the well-being of others. Even if they disagree with you. To listen. To consider. To engage in ongoing dialogue. We have to avoid offense while continuing to speak truth with grace. We have to forgive. 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 Even when we're offended. We have to disagree without being disrespectful. It's not just nice. It's necessary. So before this November 5th. And afterward. Start a conversation. Have a debate. Make your case. Cast a vote. 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 But let's remember to be civil. And let's love each other just as Christ loves us. Hey, good morning, everybody. Hey, um, every week we come up on this stage and an expression that you know around here is we say we want to make this campus, make this place look more like heaven. Um, and I'm not sure if there are a more important couple weeks than the next couple weeks that we have coming up to do that. And so we just uh, want to invite you into that. Uh, Bethel is trying to give you a platform, a structure, make it easy to be awesome Jesus followers during this election season. Uh, if you want to take out your phone right now, you certainly can and scan that QR code up there. It takes you to a website called Motivote. Um, and this is a game plan, a platform to register to vote, to get people together to vote, to have conversations to vote. There's some gift cards and giveaways and things like that. It makes it really easy if you don't know where your polling station is, how to get there, um, all those sorts of things. Again, at Bethel, we want to give you a platform and make it really easy to look like Christ over the next couple weeks. Above all, as the video says, we encourage and pray that you have hearts of humility and love and care for each other during this season. Um, that is my ultimate prayer, that this place does look like heaven over the next couple weeks. Weeks. So thank you for being amazing, thank you for participating, thank you for registering to vote, and thanks for being the most incredible students on the face of the earth. What's up, Bethel? It's 1020. What's up, Bethel? It's 1020. Welcome to What's chapel. Up, Chad? Welcome it's 1020. To chapel. Welcome to chapel. We're so glad that you chose chapel today. We are so glad you chose chapel today. What a joy it is to gather together as a community and worship God. What a joy to gather as a community to worship God this morning. We want to say welcome to our amazing community and also to any guests joining us this morning. We're so glad you chose chapel today. Let's stand together and worship Him now.
been some of the most challenging weeks I've had in my time at Bethel. As someone who has always experienced anxiety to some extent for as long as I can remember, to the point of making me sick, including today, um, and someone who strives to be perfect even though I know I can never truly attain perfection, school can be really challenging for me. As the school year progresses, I become more and more stressed and less and less um, strong in, like, in the sense of being able to do anything to alleviate this stress. Do any of you guys feel the same? I'm sure that somebody does. As tensions arise in relationships and schoolwork exceeds what I feel I am capable of accomplishing, I begin to feel as though I'm drowning. When I come to this dilemma where it feels impossible to move forward, I remember Ecclesiastes chapter three. This may seem like an uncommon book to point to for um, finding peace in times of trouble, but it's actually an incredible reminder that God has created a time and a place for everything even the bad things, quote unquote bad things. Verses one through three read, for everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up. And it continues on like this for several more verses. Then in verse 11 it reads, he has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. This may be a time when you feel like you are being broken down, as I currently feel, and this too is part of the ultimate plan that God has for you. You see, even when we're in a time where we feel like everything around us is kind of crumbling, this has just as much a part in shaping you as the quote-unquote good moments may have. And so as we continue to worship together, Remember that even when you don't feel like you have the strength to go on, God does.
I've still got joy in chaos I've got peace that makes no sense So I won't be going under I'm not held by my own strength Cause I've built my life on Jesus Yeah, He's never let me down He's faithful through every season So why would He fail now? He won't next song that we're going to sing is a little bit low and I encourage you guys just listen to these words just take these words to heart when the earth is quaked before 
moved by the sound of his voice. Seas that are shaken and stunned can be combed and broken for my regard. And though it all, though it all, my eyes are on you. And though it all, though it all, it is well. And though it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. And it is well. From me to not believe, even when my eyes can't see. In this mountain that's in front of me, we'll be thrown into the midst of the sea. Oh
guys can have a seat. Well, last week in John chapter 11, uh, John told us an unbelievable story. How did you respond to that story? Did you pass it off? Or did you let it change you, shape you? Well, one thing I know is the disciples, well, it changed them. <laughs> it shaped them forever. See, the disciples, they did not forget that story. In fact, that story changed everything for them. Their lives would never be the same again. So as we continue our series today, this week, Come and See the Gospel According to John, we actually are going to pick up this story where we left off. The very next chapter, chapter 12, this same group of characters is together again. Yep, they're all here. Lazarus, Mary, Martha, the disciples. Here they are days after the unbelievable happened. Days after Lazarus was raised from the dead. They're gathered together once again. So this morning as we read this scripture, we're gonna read it a little differently than we have in the last few weeks. And we just want to invite you to imagine yourself in this story as one of the characters. So we're going to read it three times, and each time we want you to imagine yourself as a different character in the story. So I just invite you to sit back, close your eyes, and picture what it would have looked like to have been in this room as one of these people. What would have looked like? What did it smell like? What did it sound like? And maybe even, what did it feel like? What were the feelings that you would have experienced? First up is our friend, Mary. Hey Bethel, my name is Mary. It's hard to imagine, it was just a little bit ago that I was so frustrated that I didn't even wanna see him. I know you're not supposed to say that about Jesus, but he was willing to do miracles for, for everyone else. Why not me, our family, my brother Lazarus? Well, that's what I thought. But I'm embarrassed to say I couldn't have been more wrong. And not only was Jesus willing to do a miracle for our family, he was willing to invite our family into the miracle. And now, I guess I'm just waiting for the opportunity to thank him. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here, a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard and expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As a keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came, not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. Hey Bethel, my name is Lazarus. Can I ask you an honest question? 
Did any of you know my name a couple weeks ago? That's all right. Of course you didn't. No one did. I was a nobody. I was just a, a follower, one of many following this rabbi, this miraculous rabbi, Jesus. You probably want to know what it was like to be raised from the dead. Well, to be honest with you, it's, it's hard. The attention, the fame, the questions. I don't know why, but I didn't expect it to be like this. Is it okay that I feel this way? Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here, a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume, and she poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As a keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came, not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well, for on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. Hey Bethel, well, my name is Judas, Judas Iscariot. Hello world, I guess. I don't know why, but today kind of seems like my entrance onto the scene. I've been around for a long while now, following Jesus religiously. I'm in awe of him, honestly. The way he leads, the way he teaches, the way he heals. Just thankful to be with him that he calls me his disciple. And I'm glad to be. I, I need to be. I'm glad to follow, glad to learn, glad to protect. You guys, things are getting crazy after this Lazarus thing. I think he's glad to have us around too. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here, a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As the keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came, not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well, for on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. So now just take a few minutes and sit with that story and sit with Jesus. Consider asking God to point out what he wants you to notice and pay attention to in, those, in that story. 
And as you reflect and respond, there's some questions on the screen. If those are helpful to you, feel free to answer those. And then in a few minutes, Pastor Nick will gather us back together to lead us through communion. Well, it was just a few days later that Judas would step in again, uh, this time to betray Jesus. That night before, though, uh, Jesus gathered all well, these guys together. Now, they sat down for the Passover meal, and Jesus shared something that would change everything. Does it change everything for you? Jesus took the bread that night and he broke it. He broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. And likewise, after supper, he took the cup. He stood and he looked his friends in the eyes and said, this cup, well, this is my blood poured out for you for the forgiveness of your sins. And then he said this, he said, whenever you take of the bread and the cup, do so in remembrance of me. In remembrance of the new covenant between God and you, his followers, his friends. Bethel, I invite you to come to the table this morning to commune with the living God what a privilege, what an opportunity. I invite you to do so in remembrance of these stories, of Jesus' life, of his death, of his resurrection, and the new covenant that he now has with you. What a gift this morning. Stationed around the room will be our wonderful friends, our RDs and RAs from student life, the people that live life with you all. And they're excited to offer the elements to you this morning as we play this last song. I invite you to stand, to sing, and when you're ready, come down and share in the Lord's Supper together. All of the bread is gluten-free. After you have partaken in communion, you are free to exit or stay in worship a little bit. I love you guys. Have a great week.